Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers of the program, uh, especially Bobak and Aslan, to providing me opportunity to stay the whole trimester. I had a productive uh, time and I got to talk to a lot of good researchers and talks and everything. And thank you all for attending my talk. I, I'm going to speak about crypto systems based on uh, group theoretic problems. I give a survey, um, some new results, and if the time allows, some uh, open problems. Uh, first of all, I start uh, with uh, some basic definitions of uh, group theory. The way we define groups in uh, combinator group theory is uh, using uh, presentations. Is, uh, so presentations are ways of defining groups as uh, quotients of free groups. Um, so let X be a set of alphabet and a relation over X is any pair W, W prime of reduced words of X and we write uh, W equals W prime and we, we also write it as W, W prime inverse is uh, equal to identity. And uh, consider R be the set of all relations and uh, we define presentation as a pair set of generators and relators. If the group is uh, finitely presented, meaning that it's uh, both finitely generated and finitely uh, related. I'm sorry? So it means it doesn't have x, x inverse, for example. There is no cancellation. We, we get rid of all those. Uh, so now, if you assume f of x be the, be, be the free group on the set x, and define n to be the smallest normal subgroup of f of x containing the set w, w prime inverse, uh, such that w equals w prime in the set of relator, then the group defined by the presentation xr is the quotient of xn by, by, by n. So this is just a description of a, of a group. Um, so there are several algorithmic problems came out of uh, k k coming out of this. So for example, word problem, conjugacy problem, isomorphism problem. So these are the main ones. And later on, people introduce other problems. Uh, so the word problem that uh, here we make it more precise, I call it word decision problem, is as follows. Given a finitely presented group G, uh, does there exist an algorithm to decide whether or not a word in the generator is the trivial word? So this problem, in, uh, in general, may not be solvable, meaning that there are groups in which this problem is not always solvable. There is another problem, uh, namely decision conjugacy problem, so again, we have a finitely presented group. And uh, the question is, does there exist an algorithm to decide whether or not an arbitrary pair of words U and V in the generators of G are conjugate? In other words, is there an X in G such that X inverse U X is V? Yes? When you say not solvable, when you're saying it's, it's not decidable. Yes, not decidable. That's what I mean. Yes, good point. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So this problem also may not be well, decidable. When you, when you say may not be, it depends on the group. Yes, uh, yes. So the, in, the exactly, the exactly. So in other words, there, there are groups in which the decision conjugacy problem is not decidable. Um, motivating by the group-based cryptography, uh, group-based cryptographers define conjugacy search problem in which we assume the decision conjugacy problem is solvable. Um, in other words, given two conjugate words u and v, is there an algorithm to find a z such that z inverse uz is v? So it's a search problem. And this problem is always decidable for any group. And the proof is, uh, is not so hard to, to see. Uh, there is one more notion that I want to talk about, and that's uh, growth rate of a group. If you have a finite group, that uh, I think that's what uh, usually you work with, every group has order. Um, 
But if you have infinite group, which is uh, in our case, um, in, in some of the groups that I'm talking about, we have the notion of growth rate of a group. So let G be a group finitely generated. The growth function gamma from n to r is defined to be gamma n is the number of words w in g such that the length of the word is less than or equal to n. Um, so lw is the length of the word in the generators. It could be um, the normal form of an element. Um, and there is an obvious relation between the growth function of a group and the key space um, of the group. So you're all familiar with uh, Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Um, so in 2000, two Korean mathematicians uh, came up with the idea of um, non-commutative or non-abelian version of Diffie-Hellman. So here, we assume that uh, the group we take is a finitely presented, perhaps infinite, non-commutative um, group such that uh, finding normal form of every element is efficient, um, which implies the word problem is, uh, is efficiently solvable. And solving the conjugacy search problem is hard, hopefully in exponential time. And take two subgroups of G, A and B, such that all elements of A commute with all elements of B. So this is the way we write. Um, and now make uh, group G, the subgroups A and B, and element G are public. And denote um, GH instead of the power, be H inverse GH. So now, Alice and Bob want to communicate over in secure channel. Alice chooses a random element A in A, which is one of those subgroups, and sends GA to Bob. So GA, A inverse GA. And Bob chooses a random B in B and sends B inverse GB to Alice. So now since AB is equal to BA, the shared key is GAB, which is computable for both Alice and Bob. So in order for an adversary to obtain the shared key based on given information, she or he must solve the conjugacy search problem. I have a question. So the assumption, when you said the conjugacy search problem is hard, so here, you, I mean, here you're assuming a very specific distribution on the envelope. Yes. Right? Is there any reason to think that hardness on this distribution is somehow related to the overall worst case hardness of These are all interesting questions that, uh, that we have to think about it more carefully. These are great questions. Uh, I'm just, um, I'm just giving you the overall ideas and how it, I mean the, yeah. But these are excellent questions, actually. All right. So just to summarize, the platform group for requirement for, for the protocol that I mentioned, just to summarize, you want it to be finitely presented. Uh, you want it to have efficiently computable normal form. The conjugacy search problem has to be exponential time. And the group, you want it to have exponential growth rate for a large key space. and you want it to be resistant against all existing attacks. And one of the main ones uh, is so-called length-based attack, which is a heuristic um, algorithm to solve the conjugacy search problem. So just give you an idea of uh, one of the example groups. Uh, they're called polycyclic groups. They're very interesting. They're generalization of cyclic groups, but with uh, more um, complicated and complex algorithmic theory that perhaps could offer us um, more secure uh, platforms for cryptology. So uh, a group is called polycyclic if there is a cyclic series through the group. In other words, um, a subnormal series of finite length with cyclic factors. So you have this 
um, finite subnormal series such that the quotient of the consecutive one is cyclic. It could be finite cyclic or infinite cyclic. Uh, what's subnormal? Normal, so, so right, so the, the groups that you're dealing with are mainly abelian groups. Um, but, uh, but, um, so if you have, uh, so n is normal in a group G, if for every element G in G, this is, so, and then when you have this, you can define the quotient. The, the question That's, is, what is the word subnormal? Yeah, what's oh, it just means like I, I have this uh, finite, finite normal series. That's what I mean, basically. Each inclusion, uh, yes. GI is normal in GI plus. Yes, yes. Oh, each GI is normal in GI plus. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that, that, I think that. Because then you can define this uh, factor group in each case. So, so there are examples. For example, every finite degenerated nilpotent group, or every finite degenerated abelian group is polycyclic, or you're familiar with dihedral group of order eight, so this is a finite polycyclic group. Um, they Does it have to be finite, the ratio, the ratio, like it? No, it could be finite or infinite cycle, in, uh, yes. And that's actually what we consider. If you count the number of those that have um, infinite cyclic, so there is a name attached to it, they call it Hirsch length. And, you know, it's like how many copies of Z this group includes, and it's invariant of the choice of the series, yes. Um, and it, it goes back to how complicated a group get, get to be. Um, so these groups are very interesting because they're finitely presented and there is a name for it that you can have a polycyclic presentation. So you have set of generators and set of relators that are in this specific form. So they're, they're finitely presented. You can always work with computers. Um, they, using induction, uh, they all have a um, unique normal form. So every element can be uniquely written as A1, E1, up to A, N, E, N. Um, so here are a couple of simple examples of a polycyclic group. So this has three generators with these relators, or this one has two generators with these relators, you can show that they are polycyclic. Um, so in 2004, with, uh, together with uh, Bettina Eich, uh, I proposed a polycyclic group as a platform group for um, non-commutative Diffie-Hellman that I mentioned. So as I mentioned, they are finitely presented. They, the normal form can be efficiently com computed um, by so-called um, collection algorithm. And the growth rate of a non-virtually nilpotent polycyclic group um, is uh, exponential by result of two fields medalists, Milner and Wolf, in 68. And recently with uh, David Garber and Ha Lam, uh, we showed that uh, there there are certain classes of uh, polycyclic groups in which the length-based attack that broke the braid group-based um, crypto system uh, is secure. Um, recently with uh, Jonathan Gryak and Conchita Martinez Perez, um, we came up with this result that there are classes of finitely presented metabelian groups in which the conjugacy search problem is at most exponential in the case of um, and um, in, in, in one case that uh, we call this group's generalized metabelian bombs like solitaire group, the conjugacy search problem reduces to the discrete log problem. Um, so there are many polycyclic groups that are uh, metabelian, so this is the, this is the connection. Um, so I promised to give a survey talk and talk about all sorts of groups that have been proposed for different kind of group-based uh, crypto systems. So the first one was um, braid groups. Uh, so they are generalization of symmetric groups that you know. Um, 
uh, so it was proposed by Ko Lee, and based on the fact that uh, the, uh, the conjugacy search problem is hard in these groups, but there was this uh, length-based attack that uh, could break a uh, descriptive system with some parameters. And then I mentioned about the polycyclic groups. Uh, Thompson groups has been proposed by Spirin Ushakov in 2005 based on the complexity of decomposition problem, which is more general than um, conjugacy problem. Uh, two British mathematicians, uh, Martin Brightson and James Holloway, proposed uh, hyperbolic groups, uh, thinking that the conjugacy search problem is hard. However, um, they actually came up to, to show that this uh, problem is, uh, is in polynomial. And recently with Indira Chatterjee and uh, Ni Lu, we came up with a crypto system based on um, this subgroup distortion in Gorm of hyperbolic groups and geodesic length problem. Um, with uh, Ramon Flores recently, we proposed using uh, right angled arting groups, and I will tell you what they are. And uh, it's very interesting because um, they have, um, they, they connect um, graph theory with, with this um, group theory problems. So the, why, the, the reason we propose them is that um, the word problem can be solved actually in linear time in, in such groups. And we define a subgroup isomorphism problem, which is somehow equivalent to um, subgraph isomorphism problem, which is MP-hard, and um, group homomorphism problem. And we propose the authentication schemes based on um, difficulty of these two problems. Free metabelian groups has been proposed by Spirain and Zapata in 2006 um, based on the fact that subgroup membership, uh, membership search problem is hard. Yes? Um, so metabelian group is, um, so if you have a group G, and you can write it in this way, if N and H are both abelian, then you call it metabelian. Um, in other words, you can have this short, um, short exact sequence so that these two are abelian. Yes? So, uh, maybe I just question on understanding the property. Uh, when, so, the problem being hard is related to the, the difficulty, it is, that implies that the triple system is hard. Yes. Right. So, that's actually yeah, excellent. Like, that's because the encoding and decoding are different <coughs> or something. But, like, so, you have this polynomial complexity work problem that's good for some reason that I don't understand. I will actually talk about it. I have a secret sharing scheme. If I have time, I'll tell you about it and see why it's good to have a polynomial. It's a, yeah, uh, it's, so it's a hybrid of Shamir scheme and um, using group theory to propose a secret sharing scheme. Yeah, so you're right. You want hard problems for cryptography. Not always easy. Um, I just want you to see what groups are proposed. I, I don't think I can, but I will tell you about the right angled arting groups. I think it's very interesting. I actually saw several talks talking about uh, graph theory and this, they, they actually could give some solution uh, from group theoretic aspect. I will also tell you in this talk about free nilpotent P groups. Um, so it's a joint work with Vladimir Spirain and we propose a semi-direct product public key. And with uh, my Catalan co-author, Jordi Delgado and Enrique Ventura, we propose free groups uh, for a secret sharing scheme. And so we also, so these are finite structure, the rest were all infinite, uh, except the free and important P group. So this is a semi-group of matrices over group ring and small cancellation groups we proposed, and linear groups by Bombslag, Fine, and Shu. Grigorchuk group has been proposed, and also a um, group of matrices by Grigoryov and Ponormenko. Okay, so in this part of the talk, I, I'm going to talk about a key exchange using semi-direct product. Uh, so you all remember the Diffie-Hellman public key exchange. 
So Alice and Bob agree on a public finite cyclic group and generating element G. And G is uh, multipl written multiplicatively. Alice picks a random natural number A and sends G A to Bob. Bob picks a random natural number B and sends G to G B to Alice. And now Alice computes K A, which is G B A. Bob computes K B, which is G A B. And since A and B commute because they're both in Z, uh, then uh, they're both in the possession of the same key. Yeah? So, it's very group theoretic. No, 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 I mean, this makes total sense. I, I was just like, somehow, like, because Z is commutative is a very, like an odd way to me to- Yeah, like, I just want to- like, Because of exponentiation, <laughs> like sort of the semantics of because I want to pick this and then make propose a new, so I that's why that I that insist on that. That's is, why I make it. Is there a sense in which exponentiation is some action of Z on, you know, the powers of G, the cyclic group generated by G, in the same way that conjugation is an action of a subgroup on, on some bigger group, or like those sort of special? No, this this is going to be different. Um, and this is. Operations in some formal sense. Right. This is going to be different. Give me five minutes. If you didn't understand, I'll go back to it. So to recover, to, so the security assumptions based on the fact that to recover GAB from this triple is hard, or to recover A from GGA, which is a discrete log problem, is hard. So the question is, is that uh, why can't we just uh, multiply GA by GB, right? You have the same setting. Then Alice just multiplies GB by GA, and Bob computes GA times GB, and they're all equal, right? So they have shared key, but the drawback is that everyone else can do it. But we get this idea to propose this uh, semi-direct product key exchange. So just before that, uh, let me remind you of the semi-direct product. Let uh, G and H be two groups. Let R ought G be the group of automorphisms of G, and uh, let phi be a homomorphism from H to ought G. Then the semi-direct product of G and H is the set gamma. Uh, so this is semi-direct product of G and H. So it's a pair GH such that G is in G and H in H, and uh, with the group operation given by when you multiply GH by G prime H prime, uh, the second component is the same, so you just multiply H by H prime. So here note that uh, G is normal in the whole group gamma. Uh, but the first component is going to be G phi H prime G prime. So here G phi H prime denotes the image of G under the automorphism phi H prime. Um, so if you take H, if you take the second, if you take the second group to be the group of automorphism of G, uh, then the corresponding semi-direct product is called the holomorph of the group G. Thus, the holomorph of G usually denotes, we denote it by whole G, and is the set of all pairs G phi, uh, such that the multiplication is defined as follows. When you multiply G phi by G prime phi prime, you get phi prime G, G prime, and the last two automorphism you just multiply, phi phi prime. So this is often to, to be more practical to use a subgroup of ought G. And also if you want the result to be just semi-group, semi not necessarily a group, we can consider um, the semi-group endomorphism instead of the automorphism. So how much time do I have? It's uh, 25. So here's a key exchange that we proposed. So let G be a group or a semi-group, and an element G in G is chosen and made public. And also uh, phi, which is an auto arbitrary automorphism or endomorphism of G is also public. So now Bob chooses a private um, N in N, and Alice chooses private M in N. So now Alice computes G phi to power M. So you basically inductively multiply G, G phi by itself. So the first component, the second component is just phi M. 
But the first component looks like this. If you keep doing that inductively. Um, but Alice doesn't send the second component because if she does, then the problem is just going to be the discrete log problem. So nothing's happening. Nothing's good about it. So she only transmits the first component, A. The, only the first component of this. This is the product in the group of M minus one different, or M different group elements that are. No, it's when just. You write, when you write. So I mean, it's what? like you multiply G5 by G5. And then you multiply the whole thing by G5, and so on. Uh, okay. You just. So, so we're, uh, sorry. Uh, okay, so the G, G comma phi is an element in the semi direct product, and we're exponentiating that element. Yes. Yeah, okay. So, so the group. It, it looks like this, but you can still compute this using. Uh, so this is the group that we consider. So this is one element, and yeah. phi is in odd, and then you just multiply them m times, and you get g phi m. Right. My, my concern was that this would take time proportional to m. It actually is very fast. But it's not because you didn't put exactly. It that. Yes. Okay. So Bob computes. So n was. Bob's secret key. So he computes G phi n, and he gets exactly similar thing to what Alice got, uh, but with n. Uh, so again, he does not transmit phi n, because then the problem is just going to be discrete log, because you have phi, and just finding n is going to be the problem. So he calls the first component b, and sends it to Alice. And now Alice computes bx times a phi m. So b is what Bob sent, a is what she has, phi m she has. So I'll tell you in a bit what x is. Um, so if you do that, then the first component is going to be phi m b a, uh, which we claim now that is going to be uh, Alice's key, which is going to be shared with what Bob can compute. So note that she cannot compute x phi m, and she doesn't need to. She doesn't really know the automorphism x, because it was never computed. But it does, she doesn't need it in order to compute the first component. All right, so now Bob computes a y b phi n. So the first component, again, is going to be phi n a b. So again, he only uh, transmits the, uh, he, he only takes the first one and he cannot um, compute the second component anyway because he doesn't know uh, why. So now, yeah? So now because what Bob can compute, uh, sorry, what Alice can compute is equal to what Bob can compute and is equal to G phi m plus n, then both Alice and Bob have the same shared key. Okay? But is there exist x and y such that this relation? Right, right. But I mean you only need the you only need to compute the first one. You don't need x x and y in any ways. Okay, so this might be interesting to you because the special case is uh, Diffie Hellman. If you take G to be a multiplicative group of order P Z P Z P zp star. So then the automorphism phi g is a gk. Um, so for Alice, when she computes g phi m, so this one, if you consider all phi, phi g to be gk, um, then the first, the first component is going to be this element. And it's a simple geometric series that is uh, going to be equal to this element here. Um, so you can, with some computation, you can basically see that the shared key is going to be k, sorry, g, it's going to be this. So the Diffie-Hellman type problem would be to recover a shared key that I said k from this triple. So now notice that g and k both are public, 
So this is equivalent to recovering J, G, K, M plus N from this triple. This is exactly standard diffie Hellman problem. So this is just a special case. Um, so we proposed a couple of platform for this. One of them, uh, we proposed a, a semi-group of matrices over some group ring. Sorry, you go back. Which is a special case of which? So this formula, this isn't. So if you consider G to be ZP star, uh, Diffie-Hellman is a special I case of the semi-direct product. Then, I yes. Sorry, I missed. No worries. Do you all know about group ring? Or so just very quickly, if you have a group G and a commutative ring R with non-zero unity, then the group ring RG is uh, defined as the set of all formal sum in this way. Um, you define addition to just add the AI and BI, and that's how you define multiplication. Uh, at the beginning, we proposed to use semi-group semi of three by three matrices over uh, group ring Z7, A5, where A5 is alternating group of on five elements. Um, so the way we define the automorphism here, uh, we took uh, two matrices, one invertible conjugate matrix H and a non-invertible matrix M, and the shared key that we came up with is H minus M plus N and HM M plus N. So as I said, the automorphism is just a conjugation. I don't have time to go over the detail, but uh, from what I said is that uh, when Alice computes uh, the first component of what I mentioned, um, this is going to be H minus M HM to power M. And similarly with Bob, is going to get this one. And the security assumption is basically to recover the shared key uh, from this tuple. We assume this is hard. Or to recover M from H minus M, HMM -M is hard. So it's more general than a discrete log problem. So there was some problem with this because the dimension of this is uh, very small and it's prone to so-called linear algebra attack. And recently we proposed um, uh, free nilpotent P groups. Yes, sorry. So we just did some experiment for, with that and it was, uh, I mean, A5 is simple, so it was, uh, not, um, uh, the homomorphism attack didn't work, so that was very good. And when you have this uh, three by three matrices over this, so it would be large enough, but at the same time, um, it, it was secure. So we did some experiment with that. So that was the idea. Um, so we also, Proposed um, free nilpotent P groups. Uh, so remember what I define as a free group. So if you if you consider the normal subgroup FPR is generated by all elements of the form GP um, on on uh, R generators, then the factor group FR FPR. Um, so every non-trivial element therefore has order p. Uh, and if p is prime. Uh, so I also need to define uh, what a nilpotent group is. So first of all, uh, what is commutator of a and b? So if you denote this by a inverse b inverse a b, uh, then inductively, if you have a commutator y1 to yc plus 1, uh, denote the, you know, the, you know, you just take the commutator of C of them and the YC plus one, and de uh, denote this by gamma CG. Um, and if 
if gamma C plus one is the identity, then you, you say this group is nilpotent of class C. Um, so you can define also the factor group FR gamma C plus one FR. So this is uh, called a free nilpotent group of nilpotency class C. However, this is infinite. But the one that we want to propose um, is, uh, is going to be finite. It's, so it's G, which is this group. So it's free nilpotent P group. So it's uh, finite. And the order depends on P and class of nilpotency and R. And for efficiency reason, uh, we keep C and R fairly small. Uh, say it's nilpotent of class two or three. However, we, we pick P to be uh, large enough to make the dimension of linear representation of G so large that a linear algebra attack doesn't work. And in this case, uh, this dimension is basically one plus P. So if you take P to say be 100 bit, then the linear algebra attack is uh, infeasible. So how much time do I have now? 10 minutes, okay, good. Okay, good, so I think now I can answer your question about the secret sharing. Um, so this scheme is a joint work with Maggie Habib and Vladimir Spirin. So it's a hybrid of Shamir's scheme and um, another scheme that uh, we propose, but I, I'm not talking about, just say it all in one. <coughs> So the secret is, a, is an element K in ZP, just exactly like Shamir's scheme. And the dealer uh, chooses a polynomial F of degree T minus one, such that the constant term F zero is K. And the dealer determines um, <coughs> integer KI, which is FI. So polynomial is FX. Uh, that need to be distributed to participant PI. And now the dealer makes public uh, generators X1 to XM. <coughs> so this is interesting. The dealer distributes over a secure channel to each participant PJ, the set of relators RJ. Uh, so each, each participant PJ has a, has a group uh, GJ such that this group has efficiently solvable work problem. Okay. So now, over open channel, uh, the dealer distributes uh, k column vectors, bj. So these are all words in the, in the generators x1 to xm. And the column vectors bj are chosen so that the participant pj's group precisely has a kj of the words that are equal to one. So these words are either identity or not. So that's, uh, that's what it's coming to. So participant j checks if bij is the identity in his or her own group. And then she adds all those um, ones, basically, the ones that, that are equal to identity, and that's going to be the KJ. So KJ is not just being sent over, over some secure channel, it's over uh, open channel. So each participant now has a point FI, which is a KI. So now, just exactly like Shamir's scheme, uh, any T participants can now recover the polynomial F using uh, Lagrange's uh, interpolation and therefore uh, can come up with the constant term F0 and find uh, the secret K. Um, so the scheme has two advantages over Shamir's scheme. The relators do not depend on the secret and the values Ki can be sent over upper channels rather than secure channel. And for security, so for sufficiently large K, K was those um, column vector. So the brute force attack uh, attacks are infeasible because uh, you have two to power K uh, choices of the, for the secret. And we can choose different types of groups for each participants 
to ensure that dealer can distribute words that are random looking. Yes. How big are the shares? Yeah, in terms of like, you know, so your secret is one element of CP, so it's log B that's something that you can think about that. So like, how much information has to be sent to, to for the part, part, parties to look to compute their share? Um, or is that still mean? So KJ is the number of those elements that are, those words that are the identity. Well, I, so the question is, the dealer sending KJ, or is it the dealer sending the relations and the... No, no, the generators are public. Oh. The dealer sends the relators over a secure channel. Right, so I guess how many relators have to get sent? Um, it, it could vary. It, that's, uh, it, it could vary. It's just what we care is that we want the work problem to be efficiently solvable. Sorry. So it doesn't matter. It could change. But we want them to be different so that the eavesdropper cannot guess. Uh, so there are some, some candidates. For example, one of them is uh, right-angled uh, arting groups. So they're interesting groups. So if, you have, um, so if you have a graph, say like V1, V2, V3, V4, so the group is generated by the set of vertices. And there is a relator if, they are connect, if there is an edge between them. So now, for example, we have V1, V4. So this is the identity. And all of them uh, can be, you know, you can write everything that is connected. So it's, this is an interesting um, class of groups. So there are basically. Um, of this form. So the good thing about them is that the word problem in this group is uh, linear. And they're finitely presented. They're basically between a billion and three, three billion. If, if you have no edge, it's free. If you have everything's connected, it's going to be a billion. Do I have time for five more? OK. Um, so shall I tell you a digital signature scheme? Yeah? OK. So this is a, a joint work with my former PhD student, Bobby Kuparis. So we propose the digital signature scheme. So let G be a group with uh, the following properties. You want it to be infinite, finitely presented, with exponential growth rate, and such that there is no polynomial time algorithm for solving the conjugacy search problem. Uh, in the signature, we use F represents a simple mapping, F from G, uh, which maps our group to some binary representation that can be digitally encoded. And we will be using a collision-free hash function H, which maps into G. And we, no we note that our uh, algorithm, for our algorithm, Alice's public key will have to be updated uh, or change periodically depending on the number of messages she transmits. So here is the setup. The signer Alice chooses a group element G, a private key S in G, and an integer N in N. And we note that in our scheme, N should be uh, chosen to be highly composite numbers. So N is basically uh, the product of several primes to some powers. Uh, so she then computes x, which is gn conjugate with s. n is a number, s is a group element, and publishes x. And furthermore, we want to assume that the centralizer of g should be trivial. Basically, what I mean is that the set of group elements commuting with g um, consists of only the identity. Uh, the key generation is as follows. The signer wishes to sign a message m which is a bit string, she picks, a, a, she picks t uniformly at random from g and a random factorization n, which is n, i, n, j, and computes y, which is g, n, i, t. So t again is conjugation. So the signature is uh, to generate a signature sigma, compute the following. So h is the hash of m and f, y. 
and alpha is T inverse SHY. So the signature is Y, alpha, and J. And the verification is as follows. To verify the signature, first needs to compute H prime. And the signature is valid and accepted if and only if Y and J alpha is X H prime Y. I don't think I have time to go over all those good properties that I have to say, but this is the idea. And again, uh, we propose to use polycyclic groups for this. So after this um, quick introduction about some of the crypto systems that have been proposed, there are many problems that remain to be open. Um, so all these problems that I mentioned, some of them are known to be, say, MP-complete or exponential, and some of them are not. So there are many other problems other than um, conjugacy search problem or word problem or isomorphism problem that needs to be done. So I made a list here, um, and I think I stop at this point. Thank you.